David Blight, a professor of history at Yale, was on hand for the creation of the Gilder Lehman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. For the occasion, he spoke about the legacy of slavery in the United States. Among his remarks were these words. In 1869, Frederick Douglass addressed one of the last annual meetings of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was then celebrating the passage of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote for black men, by many seen as a final act of Reconstruction. Douglas left a warning as useful now as it was then to thinking about legacies. He acknowledged all the abolitionist victories and the fact that their opponents seemed in full retreat. But slavery is not honestly dead. It did not die honestly, he said. Douglas's words apply to our current racial and constitutional condition as well as his own. Had slavery's death come of moral conviction instead of political and military necessity, had it come in obedience to the enlightenment of the American people, had it come at the call of the humanity of the slaveholder as well as the rest of our fellow citizens, slavery might be looked upon as honestly dead. The former slave was reminding his country that slavery died in an all-out war, crushed by mighty might and the changed minds of some, but not of many others. It had died only against tremendous bloody resistance. It did not die suddenly because Americans awoke one day and decided to vote slavery out of existence. This warning, delivered at the peak of Reconstruction's triumph, fits as well our current historical moment. Racism, like the constitutional persuasion sometimes practiced, wittingly or not to defend it, never dies honestly. History is never so easy, and it never stops happening. With this sobering awareness, we will study the idea of legacies of the most difficult aspects of our past, because we have to. The U.S. education system often separates world history from American history. In my school, some students may never take a high school world history course. And if they do, two years may pass before they then engage with American history lessons. This gap notably impacts two crucial subjects, the Holocaust and the slave trade. Despite the event's global significance, the Indiana curriculum tends to integrate these issues more into the U.S. curriculum framing the teaching through an American perspective. For instance, addressing the Holocaust purely from an American viewpoint raises questions such as, how did it affect us, what was our role in it, and how did its conclusion alter our history? Answering just through the American lens greatly reduces the significance of the Holocaust. As those answers are, not much, we helped to end it, and again, not much. Teaching slavery through an American focus likewise prompts similar inquiries. As slavery helped to grow our nation, we fought a war to end it, and its conclusion, or lack thereof, still is inspiring ongoing fights for equality and rights. Americans today still grapple with the lasting remnants of the peculiar institution, debating the removal of Confederate statues, dismantling remaining structural disadvantages, and contemplating the worthiness of reparations. However, these discussions are often inward-focused, recognizing how slavery affected us, while overlooking the impact on the source of the slave trade. West Africa. That is the story we aim to tell today. You're listening to Empires, Anarchy, and Other Notable Moments, 
a podcast designed for deep dives that assist in the teaching of history. This is the final in a series regarding the West African slave trade. Episode number four, The Legacy of Slavery. Throughout this series, we have delved into West African societies during the transitional period of 1400 to 1700. Prior to the 15th century, specifically in 1324, Mansa Musa announced both his and the Malian Empire's presence to the world with the largest of golden megaphones. The decisions made during his hajjah resulted in Timbuktu emerging as the center for trade and learning throughout the known world. At the end of the 14th century, it would have been irresponsible for any contemporary historian to imagine the sudden but now predictable fall of Africa. The Age of Discovery brought Portuguese caravals to what would become known as the Gold and Ivory Coasts of Western Africa. However, it was the original moniker for this area as the Slave Coast that kept European ships returning for more. The West African locals were not savages. They were relentless in their demands for the best deals possible for their most valuable product. However, they could not have known that the currencies they traded for would quickly become irrelevant due to European decisions to corner markets, undercut local industries, and eventually determine that only gold would become the economic standard bearer for worldwide capitalism. Nor could they have foreseen that Africa would be locked out of the benefits of such a system, despite being the poster child for global interconnectedness at the beginning of the 1400s. The effects of the slave trade did not just cause immediate harm to humanity's Garden of Eden. It left a legacy that is still acutely felt today. Africa's present-day difficulties and the West's centuries of success are deeply intertwined. Political scientists see the African slave trade as a classic example of zero-sum politics, where the winner is only created if there is a loser, much like a seesaw. In an earlier episode, we recounted Karl Marx's economic theory about the importance of controlling the cost of labor and how much a surplus of labor benefits the entire economy. We also highlighted how these slaves were vastly more productive than the workers they replaced. Up to the 1500s, they could pay off their purchase price within a month and a half. Each individual that left via the trans-Saharan trade, as well as every soul that took the one-way journey to hell via the Middle Passage, represented a unit of lost labor input for West African economies. This effect might not have occurred if West African societies had designated enslaved outsiders far from their regional borders for transport from Africa. However, the closeness of multiple competing fiscal military states prevented slaving raids far from their kingdom's borders, which remained in a constant state of flux. Of the 12 million humans that went across the Atlantic, 77% of them, roughly 10 million, came from the local regions of West and West Central Africa. In other words, 77% of the slaves traded to the Americas came from only 9% of the land area of the continent of Africa. Around 300,000 of these souls came to the United States of America, while Brazil took in 3.1 million. Imagine if these African civilizations had found productive ways to incorporate their workers into their societies, ideally as free workers. But even if they had just kept them as their own source of free labor, these nations could have built industries that would have rivaled and likely surpass their European competitors. Every individual taken represented labor lost to Africa and labor gained in the Americas. Not just as plantation farmhands or servants as their owners utilized them, 
These individuals could have contributed to their communities as doctors, teachers, and voices for movements. Instead, their voices, and their potential for good, were silenced. One of the keys to civilization is having a surplus of people, extra people, those not needed for the production or gathering of food enable job specialization. Societies can only afford endeavors like exploration missions, research projects, or even amateur podcasters when they have surplus labor. Societal advances become luxuries for civilizations that can plan long term. The fiscal military state, however, demanded that surplus labor perform military duties, either for expanding their own slave revenue or preventing another society from harvesting their people for their gain. Their state of nature dictated offensive war for survival. By 1800, Africa's population was estimated to be half what it would have been without the slave trade. Half of the population was either sent into slavery or died as a sacrifice for the expansion of the slave trade. The fiscal military state expanded itself through violence, sending soldiers to subjugate others. Add to this the population loss due to traditional African diseases and famine caused by the changing climate during the medieval warming period. To put these effects into context, the closest historical example involves the bubonic plague's impact on Europe. Beginning in 1348, estimates suggest Europe lost between 30 to 50 percent of its total population. It took Europe 200 years to recover, and it's not coincidence that the age of exploration did not begin earnestly until the 1500s, when European nations had a surplus population that they could risk on long voyages. And the slave trade didn't just take anyone. It isn't as though the market desired farmhands and therefore only searched out and captured experienced farmers. The continual use of the vague term of slave masks the fact that Africa was deprived of future teachers, doctors, and parents. Slavers preyed upon the weak, representing the worst of humanity. Those who survived the inherent violence of the trade often represented the brightest and strongest of Africa's people. While plantation owners desired physically strong workers, they also valued intelligence. Intelligent slaves learned quickly, reducing the need for discipline. Owners could assign them more complex tasks and grant them more freedom, trusting they understood the consequences of disobedience. Nat Turner's rebellion in America illustrates the consequences of intelligent slaves seeking freedom. Turner successfully rebelled, but he was eventually caught, tried, and brutally punished. Almost 200 innocent slaves, not involved in the insurrection, were killed by white mobs fearing the spread of rebellious ideas. For slaves who experienced their own social death without hope for resurrection, the future seemed bleak. Removing the brightest and strongest left West Africa with those deemed morally corrupt by outsiders. The African big man system existed solely to enrich the leader and those who submitted to his rule. The fiscal military state, dependent on perpetual violence to swell the state's coffers, required ruthless enforcers and crucially sadistic slavers to maintain power. The slave trade provided big men access to European goods, including guns that ensured their safety from enslavement by a more powerful civilization. Their metaphorical addiction to power and literal dependence on the alcohol brought by European traders turned West Africa into a cutthroat environment. 
In short, the slave trade cultivated a culture of continuous political violence, leaving behind a people with near total disregard for human life and morals. At its worst, Africa is associated with terms such as war, famine, genocide, lawlessness, corruption, trafficking, poverty, and disease. These issues are not exclusive to Africa. They can afflict any part of the world. So why then are they frequently associated with this region? Historically, the African social contract prioritized those at the top maintaining their power, not the government providing for its people. Instances where Europeans demanded more slaves than the markets held often led to slaving societies turning on their own to meet outsiders' demands, revealing the government's corruption as insiders were instantly relegated to outsider status. As African economies became centered on slavery, big men were forced to participate as partners or risk becoming the product of themselves. Europeans undercut local products, driving West Africans out of business and leaving many unemployed, while saturated currency markets devalued life savings. However, it's essential not to generalize that all of West Africa operated as a monolithic culture. Some sought to reverse the damage inflicted by outsiders. In the 17th century, civil war erupted in the Senegal Valley with the Tubanin movement, Using Islam to break free from the transatlantic slave trade addiction, its founder proclaimed ideals akin to those of the American and French revolutions. The movement succeeded and lasted until the late 18th century. Today, West African leaders strive to distance themselves from old regimes that embrace the slave trade. Recently, leaders in Nigeria, Benin, and Ghana were all revealed to be descended from African slave traders, illustrating how a system that began 400 years ago had lasting benefits for a few and devastating consequences for many. Trust and togetherness are crucial elements in overcoming the challenges that African societies face daily. Harvard professor Nathan Nunn conducted a notable study investigating whether Africa's current state of underdevelopment could be linked to the advent of the slave trade. Published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2008, Nunn discovered a strong relationship between slave exports and greater ethnic fractionalization. According to his estimates, the entire difference in African ethnic fractionalism compared to other parts of the world can be explained by the impact of the slave trade. Historian Sean Stilwell illustrates the division between locals and outsiders by recounting his first visit to a modern-day village in Africa. A local boy deliberately led him through a convoluted path intentionally getting him lost. This strategy adopted during the slave trade involved keeping villages away from well-traveled paths or water sources to avoid detection by slavers. Trust in Africa meant keeping one circle small and automatically distrusting outsiders. The term social death applies not only to the removal of a slave from their kin, but also to the social fabric of a community. Coastal cities became associated with the slave trade, while rural areas sought to hide and create quick escape routes if needed. Professors of economic Warren Watley and Rob Gizalu of the University of Michigan point to economic incentives that led African states to develop atypically from historical counterparts. Traditional governments defend territory, requiring outposts and bureaucratic institutions for governance and tax collection. The slave trade, however, provided different incentives. Slave raids operated as one-time expenses or hidden runs as opposed to controlling extensive land masses. 
since raiders had to converge at fixed points on the coast to meet European traders, it became more practical to permanently station bureaucratic tax collectors at the ports. In this way, the slave trade incentivized state development while keeping the focus on the center of the big man's power, rather than on the edges of their kingdom. In the words of Watley and Gizalu, the conditions under which the African response discouraged political development and encouraged violence, social hierarchy, and ethnic diversity. The economic repercussions of slavery have enduring effects, impacting even today's societies. None study draws a direct connection between Africa's poorest nations in the 21st century and those that suffered the most significant population losses due to the slave trade. His analysis reveals a correlation between average income per person in the year 2000 and slave exports normalized by land area. Nations such as Benin, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, all with substantial depopulation during the slave trade, now fall among the poorest third of African nations. European nations disrupted local businesses by flooding markets with cheaper goods, exemplified by the takeover of Cape Verde, where African slave labor was imported to create cheaper African cloth, undercutting the market. Inflation of local currencies and the eventual adoption of the gold standard left Africans excluded from the global economy their slaves had helped to build. While slaves in the Americas formed the backbone of the powerful 20th century economy, West African economies could not withstand the end of slavery, which continued officially in the region incredibly until 1875, and unofficially until World War I in 1917. Disturbingly, reports persist of the human slave trade in West African nations today. As the slave trade closed, West African nations faced new economic challenges, coupled with the invention and application of technologies like the steamboat, the Maxim gun, and anti-malarial drugs. These factors paved the way for European colonization as African kingdoms that had relied on the slave trade weakened, creating a power vacuum eagerly filled by European nations. Facing economic challenges related to the loss of their colonies, European nations justified their actions at the Berlin Conference in 1884 as part of a civilizing mission, claiming the white man's burden to bring civilization to the savages. This rewriting of African history obscured the fact that Africa was once the epicenter of the interconnected global economy. The Berlin Conference overlooked the widespread acceptance of cowrie shells as currency worldwide and replaced the narrative with a skewed image of Africans trading valuable resources for worthless trinkets. While African armies may have initially been formidable opponents, by the end of the slave trade, these empires had become weakened, depopulated, and disorganized. The effects of the slave trade left African nations vulnerable, and nearly every single one was colonized and exploited by the year 1900, dealing a knockout punch to nations that were beginning to show signs of recovery from the slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade had a profound and unique effect on gender relationships in West African societies, particularly concerning matrilineal succession. West African nations traditionally embraced matrilineal or female-dominated lines of succession. Sheikh Anta Diop, in his book Pre-Colonial Black Africa, pragmatically explained this African custom, stating... You can never be sure who the father of the child is, but of the mother you can always be sure. 
Tracing family lineage through the mother's line made sense in a society highly focused on kinship. It's crucial here to distinguish between matrilineal societies and matriarchies. Despite the prevalence of matrilineal succession, men in ancient Africa still served as kings. The spread of Islam during the 12th and 13th centuries of Malian rule reinforced the concept of patriarchy in Africa. However, the transatlantic slave trade brought women to the forefront of African societies out of necessity. The trade significantly favored male slaves over female slaves, as males fetched far higher prices. Raiders shifted their focus to capturing men, leading to a higher exportation and mortality rate for African men during the peak of the slave trade. The shortage of men played a role in women taking on traditional male roles, such as becoming agricultural laborers. This transformation occurred both before and during the era of slavery, with the majority of African agricultural labor being performed by female slaves. But it wasn't confined just to the farm fields. In Senegambia, women assumed the traditional male role of traders. The Jolof nation, dominating what is now Senegambia, intentionally turned to women for trade, marrying European traders in order to secure exclusivity contracts for future deals. These women served as vital connections between European traders and African societies, teaching them local culture and languages. The Kingdom of Dahomey demonstrated even more progressiveness regarding women, creating an entire army of empowered females. Dahomey, known as Black Sparta for its militaristic nature, was fiercely bent on conquest. Despite expectations of a heavily patriarchal society, Dahomey's all-female core, known as the Dahomey Amazons, was a formidable force. This core, consisting of 3,000 heavily armed soldiers, demonstrated exceptional courage and effectiveness. Stories suggest that the force may have originated in 1625, when an all-female hunter group caught the king's attention by killing 40 elephants. The necessity of an all-female militia was evident due to military losses and the effects of the slave trade, resulting in a significant gender imbalance in Dahomey. Western observers noted a sharp increase in the number of female soldiers during the 19th century. The Dahomey Amazon's fierceness unnerved Western and African observers alike. Their impact is recognized even in popular culture serving as the direct inspiration for Wakanda's female bodyguards in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, notably portrayed in Black Panther, as well as the historical film The Woman King, which takes us within the world of the Dahomey training grounds. The gender dynamics and relationship structures in West Africa during the slave trade era were profoundly influenced by the scarcity of men in the 16 to 35 age group. This shortage of men led African women to take on roles traditionally associated with men, such as farming, trade, and even soldiering, showcasing their resilience and capability. In the context of marriage, the scarcity of eligible men created a situation where women often entered unions with other women. Marriages between women were not uncommon during this period, driven by the need for partnership in raising children and managing households. In such unions, it was customary for one of the women to assume the traditional male role, both in the marriage ceremony and in household responsibilities. The scarcity of eligible men made these arrangements a practical necessity for some couples. Moreover, the gender imbalances negatively empowered African men to engage in open relationships with multiple women. While this phenomenon had some historical precedence among powerful elites, such as kings and big men who practiced polygamy, 
The shortage of men during the slave trade era likely contributed to a broader acceptance of such relationship structures. The repercussions of these historical gender dynamics are still felt today, especially in the context of the HIV epidemic in Africa. Studies in South Africa have linked the prevalence of relationships with multiple partners to the spread of HIV within communities. In modern-day South Africa, it is not uncommon for a man to have both a wife and a girlfriend. However, when the girlfriend eventually moves on to her own marriage, it creates a pathway for HIV to spread beyond the confines of a single marital unit. While this modern tradition cannot be directly attributed to the slave trade, it is essential to recognize the enduring impact of historical events on contemporary social structures and health outcomes. The disproportionate gender ratios resulting from the slave trade have contributed to shaping relationship dynamics that continue to influence communities in Africa today. While this series is focused on the peoples of West Africa between 1400 and 1700, it is impossible to ignore the effects on all of the individuals around the world that were either directly or indirectly affected by the slave trade. Nicole Hannah Jones, an acclaimed journalist and creator of the New York Times 1619 Project, shared a poignant personal story that highlights the lasting impact of the transatlantic slave trade. In her elementary school years, Nicole faced an assignment that many students might find exciting, researching and reporting on the country or region their ancestors hailed from. This type of assignment is common in American education, fostering a sense of pride in one's heritage and an understanding of familiar roots. However, Nicole's experience took a different turn. Her family has been able to trace their arrival to America back to the slave trade, but she didn't know the specific countries her ancestors came from. She was at a loss, as most of her classmates could trace their roots to Europe or other identifiable regions. When asked to draw the flag of her ancestors' country, Nicole found herself at a loss. Feeling a deep sense of shame, she decided to approach the assignment differently. With closed eyes, she spun a globe and randomly selected a country in Africa. Her report focused on the region her finger landed on, representing the continent her ancestors were forcibly taken from during the transatlantic slave trade. This experience which was marked by the shame of her not being able to share the specific origins of her ancestry, underscores the profound and enduring impact of the slave trade's crimes against humanity. Nicole's story serves as a powerful reminder that the consequences of historical injustices, such as the transatlantic slave trade, continue to affect individuals on a deeply personal level. The loss of ancestral connections, cultural heritage, and a sense of belonging remains a painful legacy for many descendants of those who endured the brutality of slavery. It goes without saying that the violence of the slave trade, from capture to wars for freedom, are worth remembering. But when you think of a 10-year-old girl ashamed of not being able to tell the teacher that she doesn't know where her ancestors came from, puts it into perspective that we can't exclude any voice regarding the legacy of the slave trade. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to interact with the show, you can email us at resourcesbylowry at gmail.com. If you'd like to financially support the show, please look in the description for more information. As always, thank you for listening, rating the show, and spreading the word.